The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, from the land of a thousand hills, 800,000 murdered in just 100 days. They took my child and they cut her in two pieces. 25 years after the Rwandan genocide, witness a nation united. I can't explain it. It's only God, nothing else. And then, a mother who saw her baby die. Oh my God, you know, he's not breathing. And then planned to take her own life. Why am I sitting here doing all this suffering in life? On today's 700 Club. Hello everyone and welcome to the 700 Club. Well, the House of Representatives is likely to pass the Equality Act today, even as opponents say the bill doesn't live up to its name. They warn there's far more to it than meets the eye. Abigail Robertson brings us the story from Washington. House Republicans want to pull back the curtain on the so-called Equality Act, a bill minority whip Steve Scalise calls the most invasive threat to a parent's involvement in children's medical decisions he's seen during his entire time in Congress. The son can actually go to a doctor without the parent's involvement at all, even if the parents object vocally. Under this bill, the doctor has to treat the boy uh, to ultimately transfer over to be a female. Kids of all ages. I'm talking about 10, 11, and 12 year olds. It's already happening in states with laws similar to the Equality Act. In Ohio, uh, there was a, a parents that had their parental rights taken away from them because they refused to go along with uh, giving hormone treatments to their teenage child. And if doctors refuse, We've had other states that have sued hospitals who have, uh, their faith-based hospitals who have not gone along with doing a sex change operation on a child. If passed, the bill would amend the Civil Rights Act to prohibit discrimination based on sexual orientation or gender identity. We cannot allow claims of religious freedom to be used to discriminate against an LGBT individual. But Scalise argues it's strayed far from its advertised purpose. And if that's what they were concerned about, that's what the bill would have been focused on. But it's not. And it even addresses abortion. Uh, they take away the protections that taxpayer money won't be used for abortion. Some LGBTQ advocates like Kara Dansky are joining conservatives speaking out against the bill. I am certain that the people here with me today profoundly disagree with me about many issues. But we are here together to take a strong stand for the rights, privacy, and safety of women and girls. Dansky tells CBN News. If the bill is permitted to go through, it would redefine the word sex to mean gender identity, and that has grave consequences for women and girls. Hartzler, a former track coach, argues it would prove detrimental to women's sports. It tramples on the rights of women and others by forcing a top-down government discrimination against those who hold differing views on marriage and on uh, se human sexuality. While this is expected to pass the Democrat-controlled House, it's unlikely Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell will allow a vote this session. Don't expect the Equality Act to go away, however, as it's been introduced in some form each session since 1974. Reporting from Capitol Hill, Abigail Robertson, CBN News. Thanks, Abigail. It doesn't appear this is going to go away anytime soon, but it certainly is a bill to keep your eye on and to make your voice heard on whenever you have the opportunity. But this is another time when I think you look at things and realize that you have to consider the candidates that you vote for and put into the House and Senate when you have that opportunity. Well, in other news, despite all the speculation about a conflict between the United States and Iran, President Trump says he hopes the new tensions between the two countries don't lead to war. John Jessup has that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. John? That's right, Terry. The president made the statement even as congressional leaders learned about the threats prompting the administration to take countermeasures in the Middle East. Jennifer Wishon has that story. Members of Congress who lead the intelligence committees have been briefed by the Trump administration on the classified intelligence that's led to a show of American military might in the Middle East and the evacuation of U.S. personnel from Iraq. Leaders were tight-lipped as they left the briefing Thursday. We've asked for a classified briefing for the entire Congress, for the, well, I can only ask for the House of Representatives. 
which yeah, they'll last get last next week. 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 Speaker Pelosi and others complain the Trump administration is keeping them out of the loop on the eve of possible war with Iran. But on the Senate floor, Senator Marco Rubio called the Trump administration's moves wholly appropriate, saying a persistent and clear stream of information indicates Iran and its terrorist partners pose a serious, potentially imminent threat to U.S. forces and civilians in the region. The appropriate thing for them to do is to reposition military assets to the region, number one, to protect the Americans that are there in case they come under attack, and number two, to be in a, in a position to retaliate. And the reason why that is important is you hope to deter this sort of attack. But the Wall Street Journal reports there's intelligence Iran believed the U.S. planned to attack them, prompting Tehran to move weapons into position for possible counterstrikes, something the U.S. and its allies saw as a threat. But others in the administration believe Iran was planning to strike first. The concerns arose after surveillance photos showed Iranian-backed militia loading missiles onto small ships in the Persian Gulf. Some critics fear the president is being pressured by his national security advisor, John Bolton, and others who are hawkish on Iran. The president disputed that tweeting, different opinions are expressed and I make a decisive and final decision. And he revealed his hope at the White House Thursday. Senator Rubio says it's simple. If Iran attacks, there'll be a war. If Iran does not attack, there will not be a war. This escalation between the U.S. and Iran comes one year after the president pulled out of the Iran nuclear deal and reinstated crippling sanctions on the Islamic Republic. Iranian leaders say they'll start enriching uranium at higher levels if they can't reach a new nuclear deal with Europe by early July. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News, Washington. Thanks, Jennifer. Missouri's Republican-led House is expected to pass a bill banning abortions at eight weeks of pregnancy. The state Senate approved the bill along party lines Thursday, and Republican Governor Mike Parsons is likely to sign it. It includes exceptions for medical emergencies, but not rape or incest. It also stipulates doctors could face five to 15 years in prison. While a Virginia man is being hailed a hero for dramatically stopping a suicidal man from taking his own life. Colin Dozier risked his life, getting involved as the man was poised to jump from a bridge. As Charlene Aaron shows us, more lives are being saved as a result of his story. In late April, Colin Dozier was driving home around midnight when he noticed a car on the Lesnar Bridge located right behind me. He said he felt compelled by God to investigate what was happening with its driver. I uh, figured, you know, he wasn't even really near his car that much. So I just felt, you know, the Holy Spirit speak to me and tell me to go up there. The man had gotten out of his car to jump from the bridge. At that point, I ended up, uh, I was just like, Hey man, don't do it. Jesus loves you. He's got a plan for your life. Dozier, a devout Christian, says while the man whose name is Jacob didn't respond, that didn't stop him from talking and at times sharing his own personal testimony. I did what I, only thing I know to do in a situation like that and that's to pray. And I was like, Lord Jesus, please speak to this man. I pray right now you open his up his eyes and show him your love. Dozier says when police arrived, things escalated. And he said, leave me alone. I have a gun. I'm going to kill you both. Still, Dozier, a former wrestler, inched closer to the man, who by now was rocking back and forth on the bridge's railing. Dozier then made his move. I uh, went over top of his arms. I, I pinched my elbows in so I knew that he couldn't reach for anything. I stepped up on the railing and I sucked him back and I, I picked him up and I threw him down the pavement, and at that point, the police officers jumped over the roadside railing um, and were able to apprehend him. May we present you. The city of Virginia Beach recognized Dozier's heroic actions by honoring him with its life-saving award. I really believe that the good Lord puts his hands on our shoulders at times to do great things like this. And, you know, this is an individual who put his own life at risk to save another. Dozier has since stayed connected to the man, who on the night of his attempted suicide had been high on meth, PCP, heroin, and cocaine. He has since become a Christian and now attends Dozier's church and plans to be baptized. He said, you know, the fact of the love that you showed me, it just, it blew his mind to the point that he said, I want that. He said, I, I, I want that love, like, and so, I, I just told him the scripture and I, I said, you know, like, um, if, if you'd be willing, I, I'd love to, um, 
you know, pray this prayer with you. And, and he said, absolutely. And he, he accepted Jesus in his heart. Meanwhile, Dozier says other hurting people have reached out to him and at least one has come to Christ. While many are calling Dozier a hero, he's quick to give the credit to the one who saved a soul in more ways than one. I absolutely give all the glory to God. There's no doubt. I mean, this, this is not, you can't make this stuff up. This isn't a, uh, this is all God incident. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. Thanks, Charlene. What an incredible story. Terry's so grateful he was at the right place at the right time. Boy, he sure was. I mean, he had his antenna up and was tuned and ready to go and, and used his faith. Colin, we just salute you as well as the, the salutations and congratulations you're getting from the city of Virginia Beach. Way, way to be there. Way to be there. And now they have an ongoing relationship with each other. I think that's amazing. Well, coming up, it's been 25 years since the Rwandan genocide, but the memories are still fresh in the minds of the people who lived through it. We knew those hours and we would go and hide. On that day, we did the same. We would either hide under the dead bodies when we had them come to start shooting or dig a place to hide. You'll see how the nation's leaders are healing their country and making sure history won't repeat itself. That's coming up. This year marks the 25th anniversary of the genocide that took the lives of nearly one million people in Rwanda. Ephraim Graham traveled to the East African nation to see how faith and forgiveness have helped to reshape and rebuild that country. With this horizon, it is easy to see why Rwanda is called the land of a thousand hills. More than half of the population makes a living farming these lush lands. In 1994, however, this water-soaked soil became a tribal killing ground. An estimated 800,000 Rwandans murdered in just 100 days, mainly Tutsis at the hands of radical Hutus. The tension between the tribes stemmed from Belgian colonizers dividing Rwandans by ethnicity. They felt Tutsis were superior and in the 1930s mandated all Rwandans carry ID to indicate their ethnicity. We need to help one another. That is the only thing that is keeping us alive. It's hard to tell Rwanda's genocide story without a stop here at the Hotel Mikolin. It served as a refuge for some 2,000 Rwandans during those 100 dark and bloody days. The hotel was also made famous in the film Hotel Rwanda. Listen to me, good people of Rwanda. This scene recalls April 6th, 1994, the moment that ignited the genocide. Horrible news. Our great president is murdered by the Tutsi cockroaches. <laughs> they tricked him to sign their phony peace agreement. Then they shot his plane from the sky. The truth about who shot down the president's plane is still not known, but the violence that followed will never be forgotten. They took my child and they cut her in two pieces. April 29th, 1994, Alice Macarinda lost her arm, her child, and nearly her life. The Interra Hamway militia had operating hours. There was a whistle that would go at 10 a.m., marking the start, and at 3 p.m., marking the end. And so we knew those hours and we would go and hide. On that day, we did the same. We would either hide under the dead bodies when we had them come to start shooting or dig a place to hide. Scars mark the beating and mutilation Alice endured after soldiers found her and her baby in hiding. They brutally beat her husband before rescue workers pulled him to safety. When he started to come back to his senses, he remembered that they had left me. He asked the military and the police to take him back to where I was. Genocide ended in July 1994. Paul Kagame, now the president, led a rebel group to seize control of the country. Since then, he's worked toward unity. There are no longer Hutus or Tutsis, only Rwandans. President Kagame reaffirmed his commitment to never see history repeated at an event marking the 25th anniversary of genocide's end. Every day, we learn to forgive, but we do not want to forget. 
Ananias Santosi is operations manager for the humanitarian organization World Vision. He says choosing to forgive is what's moving the country forward. After the genocide, World Vision was on the ground with first aid, food, and medicine. It also played a major role in reconciliation. You cannot think of long-term development if people are disconnected, united. The radical Hutu militia pushed propaganda and encouraged citizens to participate in the killing of Tutsis and moderate Hutus. After the genocide, many of those responsible flooded the criminal system. But President Kagame refused to kill as punishment and abolished the death penalty. Instead, he offered another solution, a system of community courts called gachacha. It allowed criminals to confess and seek forgiveness. I started forgiving myself when I stood in front of the court. Emmanuel Nadiyaseba confessed his crimes after prison, became a community building volunteer, and while working, he realized he was actually on a team with one of his victims, though she had no idea who he was. We both joined the Association of Peace Building and Reconciliation that World Vision was involved in. After her attack, Alice said a prayer. I wanted to be close to God and not just be on their surface. Asking God to bring her to those who wronged her and to lead her to forgiveness. She didn't think her prayer would be answered. And then Emmanuel asked to speak with her. I was always sweaty. I was always nervous. Everything was hot everywhere. I fell down on my knees and raised my hands up and told her that I am the person who was responsible. The next thing I remember, I was at the hospital. I didn't respond. I guess I was in shock. I was still on my knees when she fainted, and they took her away. Days later, Alice asked to meet with Emmanuel and only asked he apologize to her family. She then became an advocate for him in court. I was able not to go back to prison. It's only God. I can't explain it. It's only God. Nothing else. No one else. Ephraim Graham, CBN News, Rwanda. As a symbol of unity, Alice and Emmanuel planted fruit trees together in front of each of their homes. Their hope is that their grandchildren and others will eat the fruit of their reconciliation. Forgiveness is a powerful, powerful thing. Well, up next, the founder of Peacemakers with the solution to today's caustic culture, Pastor Rich Wilkerson Sr. shares the answer when we come back. Well, between the insults and the comebacks, it seems that our public discourse today thrives on conflict. And if you don't believe me, go turn on cable news. Talking heads are fighting for the last word while trying to silence their opponents. Everybody talking at once. But Pastor Rich Wilkerson says we should aim for something different. They should try to honor instead. Rich Wilkerson is the senior pastor of Trinity Church in Miami, Florida. Rich believes we can change the name calling and bullying in our culture. I think it's all about honor. Honor opens doors for you that you cannot open for yourself. In his book, I Choose Honor, Rich reveals the answer to our angry, hurting world and offers five keys to nurturing healthy relationships. Rich Wilkerson Sr. is with us now, and we welcome you back to the 700 Club. It's always great to have you with us. Thank you. You know, Rich, the word honor usually um, comes to mind when we're honoring someone who's, who's given military service for their country. Yeah. What does honor or mean? Or at a funeral. Or at yeah. a funeral, yes, <laughs> sadly. Or at a funeral, yes. What does honor mean? Well, you know, um, I said earlier that when you look at the dictionary definitions of respect, you'll see honor. You look at honor, you'll see respect. The way I interpret it, Terry, is I can respect you from a distance and not even know you for what you've done. In fact, I can respect people that I don't necessarily agree with, but they've done something really great, and you respect that. Honor happens up close. It's hard for me to, to impact your life in a great way unless I'm close to you. In other words, I mean close for a minute. Not for a lifetime, but 
uh, honor reaches to someone in humility and servant leadership. Those two Jesus components make for common ground because if there's vitriol and yelling and upset, and, but, but honor just kind of pulls the carpet out from underneath that. Do you think we've maybe um, lost the meaning of honor over the years? I think of another way that we sometimes think of it is in regard to things that we would consider negative, like in an extreme Muslim community, honor killing, or in the mafia, honor silence. You know, it, it's not positive in that sense. Well, but, but what is that about? That starts with fear. Yeah. So as soon as fear enters the room, a lot of great Jesus things leaves the room yeah. because you have to move in faith uh, as a human. Let, let's, let's just separate it from Christianity. Yes. But as Christians, for sure, we got to keep moving in faith. And faith sees past the fear and interjects Jesus things and things begin to turn around. Well, faith also, I think, sees past the offense because, okay. you know, what do you do if someone disrespects your honor? I mean, how, how should we respond? Forgiveness, yeah. always. Because when you don't forgive, then bitterness is there to hook you deep. What? But uh, really, uh, honor looks for ways to connect. Yeah. Honor looks for common ground. Uh, you can think of politicians in years past that were on other sides of the aisles and they kind of, you know, be disagreeable, but they always had dinner together yes. at the end of the and day. Civil they were actually friends. Yes. Yeah. And, and I think we've got to get civility back into our homes. Mm -hmm. That moves to the church. That moves to the marketplace. And pretty soon honor becomes this organic thing but it's a chosen component of Jesus. It really is. It, do, it doesn't just happen. It is an act of our will, Terry, that we move in that direction. It's got to be a little bit of a mindset, doesn't it? Because I need to come to you with the understanding that there's something in you that I need to honor. It's not something that just happens spontaneously. We, like you're saying, we have to determine it inside. One of my dear friends, Keith Kraft, has a fabulous line. When you elevate your thinking, you elevate your living. And if you're up against a, a brick wall, you have to think better thoughts mm -hmm. to get around the wall, under the wall, over the top of the wall, or through the wall. It's got to better, be a better thought pattern. And that's what honors. It's just a higher level of thinking, but it's a Jesus level. And when you talk about it elevating all of that, you're really elevating the other person. Sometimes that's what's so hard about forgiveness. Sometimes <laughs> working to the place where you want to elevate the other person, getting rid of our desire to kind of even the score is a, really a surrender, isn't it? Totally. To a different way of thinking. Totally. And, and when you walk into a room, and, and if you're driven by honor, when you walk into a room, you, you look for the people that you know probably don't care for what you represent, yeah. what you have to say. That's the very first one you go to. Yeah. You love them to death and there's not much to, because it pulls the carpet out. This book is really a culture changer in any arena. You're, if you're a businesswoman and you've got a company and you've got employees, they need that book. If you're a scientist and you work in a lab with other co-laborers, you know, laborers, this right here, it, 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 pretty soon you start thinking more positive about your work for the day. And it's a culture changer. And when honor becomes that culture of your organization, you're going to thrive. You will thrive. And it doesn't mean when you honor someone else that you have to agree with the position that they hold or the, the, some of the choices that they make. Absolutely. It's really saying, I, I see value in you as a human being. And let's talk. I mean, that's how else do we change anything, Rich, if we can't get to the place where we're willing to do I that? I was so scared years ago of Muslim people. Yeah. <laughs> and two years ago, I connected with our local imam. He also teaches at the University of Miami. He loved me, so I started loving him. Yeah. Do you know, since then, I've been with him to Morocco. I've been with him to Abu Dhabi. I've met some of the leading Muslim leaders in the world. And they don't all want to kill me. 
Yes. They want to have discourse. Am I going to change my Christianity because I'm friends with them now? No, but I can certainly honor them. Yeah. You know, oh, it's, it's a you, dynamic. You talk about the impact this could have on our culture today. Your subtitle is the key to all to relationships, faith, and life, yeah. which is pretty much everything. How do we begin this honor process if it's not something that we've consciously thought of before? Get back to God. Yeah. Now, that's something that Christians don't think of, but how is my my personal walk with Jesus. You know, get, get, get alone, honor him again. That's what worship is, all right? Once that happens, now it begins to spread to the family. Mm -hmm. it begins to spread to your grandkids, to your kids. Yeah. And then it begins to spread outside the doors of your home, all right? Yeah. But it starts with you, Terry. You know, you can't ask someone else to do what you're not doing. Yeah. You know, really, yesterday we had Tim Tebow's mom on, and she's oh. written a book called Ripple Effects. And that's really what you're talking about here, too, that it starts with one person deciding they're going to make a decision to honor, and it ripples into the people and relationships around you. One of the stories of Tim is in this book, <laughs> and that foundation has impacted our San Diego church like you can't believe and that's become a church for special needs kids yeah. in San Diego because of the fact that the Tebow family has said, hey, everybody is worthy of honor. And you know, it does multiple things because not only was there a need for a church for special kids, there was a need for people to see the value so in good. people with special needs and to honor so them. Good. So good. Well, the book is so good. <laughs> Rich has even more in his book called I Choose Honor, The Key to Relationships, Faith, and Life. This is available in stores nationwide, and it really is for all of us. You know, if you're like me, I'm, I'm sick of the, the incivility and the lack of reasonable discourse. Let's choose honor. Thank you so much. Thank it's you, Terry. It's been an message. honor to be on this great <laughs> network. I mean that. Thank you so much, Rich. It's great to have you here. Well, still ahead, Fox and Friends host Steve Ducey talks about food and happiness. They go together. When I come home for my, for my uh, birthday meal, it, you know, I'm eight years old again. It just reminds me of a happy time. Everybody, it seems, has a happy food. We're gonna join Steve and Kathy Ducey in their family kitchen with The Happy Cookbook. Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News Break. Taiwan's legislature, vo legislature voted to legalize same-sex marriage today, the first place in Asia to do so. Taiwan's high court ruled in favor of same-sex marriage in 2017, but a majority of voters rejected it last year. Lawmakers made the changes anyway over the objections of churches and other opponents. Gay rights advocates believe this will spark a move to make gay marriage legal across Asia. Well, Operation Blessing Disaster Relief Teams are in India supplying people with food, water, and other supplies after a major disaster. Cyclone Fani hit the coast of India in late April, leaving a trail of destruction in its path. Families living along the coast were also left struggling with no access to clean drinking water and little food. Local authorities say it could be more than a month before electricity is restored, but with the help of its partners, Operation Blessing is supplying families with a month's worth of food, clean drinking water, and solar lamps. OB has also helped several fishermen repair their boats so they can return to the water and provide for their families. Well, you can learn more about Operation Blessing by visiting its website at ob.org. Terry will be back with more today's 700 Club right after this. Good times and good food. Those are the main ingredients inside the new cookbook from Steve Ducey and his wife, Kathy. But it was a serious health threat that first motivated Kathy to gather her family's favorite recipes all together. Recently, the Ducey's invited us into their home to talk about the food and fond memories that make up the Happy Cookbook. Take a look. Fox and Friends host, author Steve Ducey and his wife, Kathy, are known for their lighthearted take on family life. They reminisce about some of their favorite memories and recipes in their new book, The Happy Cookbook. So many of our events in life are around meals, whether it's an anniversary or a wedding or a birthday. And when you think back in time, there's a food associated with it. For instance, 
we were in Rome, I guess it was downtown, uh, next to the, I want to say the Pantheon. We had the best pizza we'd ever had. And it was just, it was a flatbread. It just had tomatoes, a little, it didn't have a lot of tomato sauce on it. And in fact, it didn't have any. And it was like, that's the best pizza we've ever had. And then we started making it for the kids. You made it from memory. That was before people took pictures of food. And that's right. <laughs> My kids would rather have home cooking than eat anywhere. And I think a lot of people are like that, because on Steve's birthday, we could go to any fancy restaurant in New York, but he wants his mom's pot roast, German chocolate cake. And then he'll have the cake for breakfast the next day. <laughs> and that just makes me happy. And you know, regardless of what went on in my day, that day, when I come home for my uh, birthday meal, I'm eight years old again. It just reminds me of a happy time. And we got to talking about everybody, it seems, has a happy food. You know, something that might remind you of your wedding or your anniversary or that place you went when your kids were little. Fond memories and good times are the main ingredients for these recipes. But the inspiration for the book came from something far more serious. In late 2015, at a routine eye exam, Kathy was diagnosed with ocular melanoma a rare form of eye cancer. It's a very aggressive form of cancer that spreads very quickly. And at that point, they didn't know if mine had spread or not. It did not, I'm okay. But all I could think of was, I've got to get my recipes together for the kids because if I'm not here anymore, they need to know how to make the dressing and the cookies. I wanted my girls to have the recipes that they grew up with. That was really the germ of the idea. And we decided we would put together our family recipe favorites and those of some of our friends and neighbors and some famous people we know. And that's where the Happy Cookbook came from. It's just a, it's a celebration of the recipes that make America smile. The Ducey say that when it comes down to it, it's about more than just the food. It's about the stories that go with it. For instance, whenever I think about our wedding reception. I think about a cake. But what happened to the cake? Well, my mom said, I'm going to bring you the cake from Abilene, Kansas. And we were getting married in Kansas City. And so it never dawned on my parents, you know, a beautiful three layer cake in the trunk of a car driving across Kansas when it's over 100 degrees. So they pull up where we're getting married and <laughs> We have the ceremony, and as we're walking toward the car, I knew something was up because right under the tailpipe, there was like dribbling frosting. It was a pink and white frosting, just like that. And I said, yeah, that's not good. And we opened it up and it, it had just smushed. It had, it had fallen. And we went to the reception uh, restaurant and my dad, who felt terrible because, you know, they had brought a, a slurry cake said to the waiter, "Could can you do anything with this? And he goes, we could give everybody a straw. <laughs> yeah, thanks. My dad convinced him, take it in the back room, come back with something. Half an hour later, he comes back. Instead of three layers, it was one. And it, it looked fine. It did have kind of a steel belted radial aftertaste, but other than that, it was a happy memory. Steve and Kathy's new cookbook celebrates those memories and also gives others the chance to make new ones. Well, there is a certain kind of communion at dinner time around the table. Cheers. And whether wherever you're breaking bread, it, it's a special moment. That's why you start the meal with prayer oftentimes, because it is a special event in your, in your day. And so we hope that when people sit down and have a meal, they realize, you know, we don't know how this is gonna go, but this meal could have a happy significance that we'll never forget about. You know, it could be the meal uh, before you're married or an anniversary, but you just never know when, when something is gonna happen where years later, you'll see that food again and it will trigger something in the nostalgia department of your brain and you'll remember, oh. Remember, every time I see a car trunk, I think, <laughs> wedding cake. 
The Happy Cookbook, a celebration of the food that makes America smile. It's available in stores nationwide, and I know that every one of you probably has a memory of your own of how food played a special part in some unique or special time in your life. Well, still to come, a widow who had to raise her daughters in a leaky one-room hut. Watch, because people like you gave her a new home and a new future. More on that when we return. Dinga is a widow who was living with her children in a one-room hut with a leaky roof. She gave her daughters what little food there was to eat. She prayed to God to provide for her family. And that's just what he did through the generosity of people like you. When Dinga's husband died, his family made it clear that she and their daughters were no longer welcome in his home. Fearing for their safety, she left. I was very angry and hurt by what happened. But as a believer, I know that I should do to them what I want to be done to me, so I forgave them. With nowhere else to go, they moved into a one-room hut on her parents' land. During winters, it was very cold and water leaked through the roof. When cooking, smoke filled the house. I couldn't leave the fire unattended because the house could easily catch fire. The smoke affected her lungs and made it difficult to do any physical work, like trekking long distances to find water or food. At times, the pain made her too weak to even get up. I gave my daughters most of my food to keep them from going hungry. My elder saw what I was doing and told me not to give them all the food because I also needed to eat. I prayed and asked God to provide for us. When Operation Blessing dug a well near their home, we learned about Dinga and saw that her house was about to collapse. So we built her a brand new brick home on her parents' property and gave her and her children new beds and other necessities. God's timing is perfect. This is the best house I have ever lived in. No matter what the weather, we have shelter. I love to clean my house, especially the walls and windows, because I couldn't do that before. With water nearby, it's easy to keep everything clean. We also gave her a cow so she could sell the milk. I now provide my children with everything they need. To everyone who helped me, may God bless you abundantly and may you never lack anything. I've stood in those houses in areas of Kenya and other countries where there are holes in the wall, leaks in the roof. People are living there having to cook inside of that with no ventilation of any kind. You know, it takes such a little bit to make a difference in people's lives. But can I tell you, there is a dignity that comes to women like Dinga when she is able to say, I love cleaning my windows, my mirrors. I love providing for my children. You help make that possible. All of the things that we were able to bless her with were a part of that. Not a handout, but a hand up. Listen, 700 Club members, I wanna say thank you to you, first of all, because that's the kind of work you're doing every day all around the world. To those of you who haven't joined yet, today's a wonderful day to do that. Our number's toll free, it's so easy to do it. You call 1-800-700-7000. You say, I'd like to join the 700 Club. That's a commitment to general membership is 65 cents a day, $20 a month. We have other club levels you can look at. Ask about those, but do something today to make a difference because we really can impact people's lives. We can honor people by seeing the value in them enough to do something to make a difference. When you call and when you join the 700 Club, we wanna honor you by sending you a gift, the plan. This is Pat's latest teaching. God has a plan and a purpose for every single person's life. But what about your life? Get a hold of this by calling now and joining the 700 Club because it'll help you figure out the plan he has for you. So call now. Well, coming up, a five-year-old girl who had been abused by a babysitter and then was told that it was all her fault. Inside, I was screaming for help make him stop, somebody help me, you know, but it, it never came out. Well, you know, 
The main thing about that was she's been healed from the trauma and now she's helping others do the same. We'll tell you the story when we return. Teresa couldn't live with the pain any longer. Months earlier, one of her sons died suddenly. Years earlier, Teresa had been sexually abused. She wanted to end the suffering once and for all, so she walked up to her fire pit in her backyard and did the unthinkable. She doused herself with gasoline. Well, I had just fed him, and it was like an hour, and I, and I jumped up, and um, I'm like, oh my God, you know, he's not breathing. Teresa Rosenthal's twin sons were just 10 weeks old when one of them, Tristan, died of sudden infant death syndrome. Her desperate pleas to God seemed to be ignored. I was begging him to let him live, and he, and he didn't live. A couple months later, Teresa was in her backyard warming herself by a fire pit when the pain completely engulfed her. Why am I sitting here doing all this suffering in life? I just poured gas, you know, all over me was six and step into the fire. But it was more than losing her son that sent Teresa over the edge. She'd already endured a lifetime of abuse, starting with her alcoholic dad. I just wanted to be able to love my father and not be scared of him. He would spank you harder than you needed, um, and just like no reason. I mean, he would beat my mother sometimes, and it's like you didn't want to hear it, but you had to hear to make sure that she was okay. My father would switch from being happy to being mean and abusive, and, and that's how I perceived how God was. Then there was the babysitter, for six months, he molested Teresa each time he came. She was just five. He would say that he was doing that because I was being bad, and he knew I was scared of my father. Father's gonna be to you. Your mother's not gonna love you. Noticing a change in her daughter, Teresa's mom asked if something was wrong, but the five-year-old was paralyzed by fear and said no. Inside, I was screaming for help. Make him stop, somebody help me, you know, but it, it never came out. The main thing that stuck was, you know, I was being bad and it was my fault. And, and, and I started to believe in it. Her mom figured something was going on and stopped using the sitter. A few years later, Teresa's dad died and she was left to grow up with the ugly scars of abuse. At 12, she found alcohol helped with the pain. Oh man, I was just shut down. I, I, I was isolated emotionally. You know, I was messed up and I, I just, you know, I just went through, before I was even 21, I was out drinking in the bars and drinking quite regularly. Hoping a loving family of her own would fix everything, Teresa married at 20. But she was too emotionally fragile to allow anyone to love or even touch her. You know, I didn't know how to be in a relationship. You know, I felt guilty and ashamed. Two years in, Teresa gave birth to their daughter but her husband soon left them. For years, she would fall deeper into depression and alcoholism. At 30, she and a boyfriend had the twins, and that's when Tristan died of SIDS. Teresa doused herself with gas and planned to end it all. Her eight-year-old daughter walked out in time to stop her. I believe that God was punishing me for the sexual abuse you know, that happened as I was a child. What am I even here for, you know? Nobody can love me. In the coming years, the only things keeping her going were her two kids, alcohol, and later drugs. She landed in jail several times on DUI charges. During her last stint, she met some women from a jail ministry. And they would play some Jesus songs before they would, you know, bring a word. And, you know, I'm not really understanding what they're saying, but they sparked my interest. And I just believe it was God making a way. Still, Teresa kept them at arm's length. That is, until she got out and found her house vandalized and her car impounded. With no one to turn to, she called the ministry asking for help. Two ladies came to comfort Teresa and invited her to church. I never, ever felt a feeling like that ever before in my life. It was just so, like, powerful and peaceful. He was preaching on Joseph. I guess I seen, you know, everything that Joseph went through. I think for the first time in my life, I had some hope. When he got done, I, you know, I just went up to the altar and the pastor prayed with me and I gave my heart to the Lord and 
it just brought something that I'd never felt. I didn't want to drink you know, or do drugs. I remember when I went to that first church service, I had no desire. I didn't have withdrawals. As Teresa began to trust God, she opened up about her past to a therapy group and discovered God's love for her. She said, God said he has been trying to love you for such a long, long time. If you will open that wall down and let him in, he will pour more love on you, all the love that you've missed out on. That's when he pulled out the abuse and, and just start walking me through that healing process, you know. That session opened me up, you know, where I, I believed that God was real and that he loved me. The shame and all that, I, you know, I think I was healed of that, um, you know, pretty quickly. In time, she also forgave her father and her abuser. Asking God from my heart, you know, to forgive him and let him turn to him and touch him like he touched me. That forgiveness was, is the key to it all. Teresa now helps other women to heal from their traumas focusing on where she found genuine, lasting love. Reading the Bible, reading the Bible. I seen God was love and it's a fallen world. God didn't cause that to happen. Jesus, he, he, he died for me because he loves me and he, and he set me free. And you know, I'm nothing without him and I love him with all my heart. My God is, as we often sing, a good, good father. And yet when we've had issues with our earthly father, it so messes up how we see God. It so messes up the way we perceive how he sees us. And then life happens. And you know, every one of us could probably sit around a table with coffee or tea and share times in life where we just got off the beaten path, where things happen to us and we put up walls to protect ourselves. And as as Teresa said, someone said to her, you know, if you'll, if you'll break that wall down, if you'll let love come inside, it'll change everything that's happened to you. And I believe that's God's message for you today. I don't know what you've been through or where you've been or how broken you are, but I do know that if you don't know God, you're not living the way he intended for you to live. Jesus said he came to set us free, free from all the things that life does to us, free from the things we do to ourselves, free from shame. I think that's part of what Teresa was feeling. There is with sexual abuse, just an inherent shame that comes over us. Jesus said his goal for us was to have an abundant life, to live abundantly. And when you see her in the role she's in now, you see that she's, she's like a flower that's opened up and that can be you too. The question is, are you willing? Are you willing to step from where you are into a place of opening up to the love of Jesus Christ? She said it so clearly, he loves you so much. He died for you to cover any of your sin as well as to lead you into the place of wholeness that he inherited, that he in, intended for you to inherit as a child of God. He is a good, good father, despite what might have happened to you on this earth. Ultimately, we get to choose where we're going. And so today I wanna to ask you to choose him. You know, maybe nobody's ever said to you, would you like to pray this prayer? I'm saying it to you right now. Would you like to invite Jesus into your heart? Would you like to be set free? You can start the process right now. Just pray with me, Jesus, I am a sinner in need of a savior. I know you died for me and today I receive that gift, the gift of your forgiveness, your acceptance, your love. Fill my heart with your Holy Spirit and with the power, your love, the power of your love that changes me. In Jesus' name I pray. What do you do now? You've prayed the prayer. You've invited him into your heart. Pat's put this together for you. It's called A New Day. Take a look. It's filled with wonderful information and it's free. So is the phone call to receive it. 1-800-707-1000. Just call and say, I prayed the prayer. I'd like the New Day packet. We'll get this out to you right away. I want to leave you today with our Power Minute from Proverbs. He who heeds the word wisely will find good. And whoever trusts in the Lord, happy is he. Well, Monday, the race against the clock to stop an epidemic, how science is trying to eradicate the superbugs. Join us then. Have a great weekend.